welcome back to the Foxhole. I'm your host, James Rosen, coming to you from the Washington Bureau of Fox News. You can follow me on Twitter, at James Rosen FNC. If many analysts have questioned the accuracy of President Obama's assessment shortly before the Paris attacks that ISIS has been contained in a shrinking operating space inside Syria and Iraq, there can be no doubting that the group's territory on Amazon.com has expanded rapidly. A brief scan of that site finds three dozen books on one facet or another of ISIS, with most, if not all, of these titles having been published within the last year. From the ranks of this suddenly rather crowded literary field comes our visitor to the foxhole today. William McCants is an adjunct faculty member at the Johns Hopkins University, director of the Brookings Institution's Project on U.S. Relations with the Islamic World, and author of The ISIS Apocalypse, The History, Strategy, and Doomsday Vision of the Islamic State published in September by St. Martin's Press. Uh, William, welcome to the Foxhole. My pleasure. So is there some claim for uniqueness that you would make for your look at ISIS as opposed to the 35 other books that are suddenly out there on ISIS? One thing I highlight in the book is its apocalyptic ideology. It's unusual for a Sunni jihadist group to really play up the end of the world, and the Islamic State does it. It does it for both recruitment and also because it believes that the world is coming to an end. It might be natural uh, as, a, as a temptation for the consumer suddenly to be faced with 36 books on ISIS to regard that a lot of them are sort of hastily thrown together mm -hmm. or some might be um, better than others, of course. Uh, what pronouncements might you make as, as someone who's now in this field as to the suddenly flourishing literature of ISIS? Is a lot of it good, bad? What do you say about it? Uh, as you say, a lot of it was hastily composed and it's written by people who often don't have a long familiarity with the group. I've been studying it for a decade. Um, I read Arabic, uh, so my account is pretty informed by uh, the prime primary sources about the organization. One of the things that I think uh, has been most hotly debated about ISIS is the question of its fidelity to the Koran. Uh, how much of, a, of an outgrowth of the actual explicit teachings of the Koran a group like ISIS really is, or whether in fact it represents a perversion of the Koran. What say you? Well, Islamic scripture is more than the Koran. It's also the words and uh, deeds that are attributed to the founder of Islam, Muhammad. And the Islamic State finds passages in those scriptures that justifies what it wants to do. I mean, Muhammad himself waged a war to establish a state. So there's a lot there to draw on. But I also notice that they conveniently ignore things that cut against their political program. Like what? Uh, for example, Muhammad several times says, don't go after non-combatants. Don't kill women and children. And it's certainly the, something the Islamic State has done because they are waging a brutal kind of insurgency that they think is pretty effective. And where in the Quran or the other uh, scriptures of, of Islam might a group like ISIS look to find any kind of justification for the killing of innocents? Uh, well, it can point to other places where Muhammad seems to have advocated extreme measures uh, when faced with an overwhelming foe uh, or a setback on the battlefield. But then again, there are other scriptures that offer the argument presentation, and the Islamic State picks and chooses, just as the member of any state uh, uh, faith will pick and choose uh, when trying to understand their faith. I guess uh, all of this is a kind of a, an elaborate way of posing a more basic question, which is whether uh, the Quran or the other kind of uh, texts of Islam that you might point to beyond the Quran uh, endorse violence in some way that makes Islam itself particularly fertile for jihadi recruitment. Well, there's no question that the Quran and other scriptures endorse violence in the service of religion, uh, but they uh, tend to try and put restrictions on it. Uh, the Islamic State tries to find ways around those restrictions because they are inconvenient for the type of insurgency it's trying to wage. So much of its strategic literature offers advice for how to argue around those parts of scripture that are inconvenient for its project. At various points over the past two years or so, the Obama administration has seemed even to dispassionate observers to struggle in its rhetorical descriptions of ISIS. At times, for example, we've been told that this is a terrorist group. At other times, we've been told it's an army 
right? Uh, how do you describe ISIS? Well, first and foremost, it's a government. It has a state that it's established in Syria and Iraq. It's a weak state, but a state nonetheless. It also is waging a number of insurgencies across the Middle East and North Africa. And then finally, it has a terror organization. So it's a hybrid group. And uh, as part of that struggle with rhetoric, uh, at times the Obama administration has uh, seemed to waver on whether it should say explicitly that we're even at war with this group. We seem to have crossed that Rubicon somewhere around September or October of 2014. Um, and just recently I asked the White House Press Secretary, uh, Josh Ernest, if uh, the President conceives of himself as a wartime Commander-in-Chief by virtue of the battle against ISIS. And Josh told me amongst a sort of a barrage of other verbiage uh, that you'd have to ask the President, but certainly such a label could be applied to him with some credibility. Uh, so do you discern a kind of um, a kind of uh, grappling with ISIS as a concept unto itself that is somehow inhibiting the Obama administration, A, from properly conceptualizing about ISIS or describing ISIS to the public, and as a further extension, perhaps confronting ISIS? Well, I think internally they've got a pretty good handle on what the organization is now. Uh, but for many years they did grapple with it. I mean, there's the famous statement that the president made about it being a JV team, and they believed that the group would collapse under their own extreme weight and you wouldn't have to really mount an effort against it. I think, of course, there's been a growing realization over the past year that more than wishes and dreams are going to be necessary in order to destroy the Islamic State and the president is putting more muscle behind it as a consequence. You, as an analyst of ISIS uh, and uh, of this presidency, uh, know that the, that the president and his aides have already made it clear that they expect that ISIS will survive in some state or fashion beyond President Obama's term. Right. Right. Um, beyond January 2017, uh, have you any way of estimating how long ISIS will be with us? Oh, it's going to be with us for a long time. Uh, I think the best we can hope for is the collapse of its government in Syria and Iraq, but it will still continue to wage a violent insurgency there. It has many other places in the Middle East and North Africa that it can move to just because of the political meltdown in that part of the world. And it has tens of thousands of foreign fighters that it can deploy to build terror cells back at home. So it's going to be with us for a long time. Our visitor to the foxhole today is William McCants, a former State Department official and MIDI scholar at the Brookings Institution, who is the author of The ISIS Apocalypse, The History, Strategy, and Doomsday Vision of the Islamic State, published in September by St. Martin's Press. What is the Doomsday Vision? Well, the Doomsday Vision is based on early Islamic prophecies of the end times, um, which say that the world is going to end and most of the apocalyptic upheavals are actually going to happen in Iraq and Syria. So whenever you have political uh, upheaval in either of those two countries, it invites this apocalyptic interpretation. Uh, the Islamic State's own spin on these things is that its state, its so-called caliphate, is a fulfillment of prophecy, that it is God's kingdom on earth reborn, the reemergence of the early Islamic empire, and this is in preparation for the end times. Did the, did the verses or the Quran, whatever you're citing, um, project some alternate vision beyond ISIS of how the end times might be achieved? Um, well, this is the, the challenge with Islamic scripture is because once you get outside of the Quran, which is pretty vague on these issues, um, there are thousands of pronouncements on how the end times will go down. Many of them are contradictory. And so Islamic scholars try to parse and, and reconcile the contradictions and it's impossible to do. The Islamic State's own reading is that there are going to be a series of caliphs, five of them to be precise, and that the last one of them will welcome a Muslim savior uh, who will take the fight to the infidel. Uh, from what I've read about ISIS's history and its animating visions and so forth, there is this uh, great fervent desire on the, po on the part of uh, the caliph, uh, in this case that's Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, correct, mm -hmm. the leader of ISIS, uh, who's believed to be where right now? Uh, we think he's probably in Raqqa, which is in western, eastern Syria. Okay. And so he, as the instrument of these prophecies, uh, is said to desire fervently some kind of great military 
uh, showdown between his forces and the forces of the infidels in the West. And specifically, that's supposed to take place, as I understand it, in two different places. One is Dabiq and the other is Rome. Am I correct about those things? Right. Okay. One shall follow the other, correct? Right. And one shall be, uh, the first shall be the kind of uh, near decimation of, um, of the true believers, correct? Yes. And the second shall be the final victory at Rome of ISIS. Am I correct about exactly. all these things? Okay. Uh, and so the, the Obama administration, and we've seen the president himself talk about this somewhat obliquely. He doesn't really descend to that level of granularity in his discussions of I what ISIS wants. Right. Uh, but uh, he seems to make the argument, President Obama, that um, we should not give ISIS what it wants, which is uh, any kind of military clash mm. from which they can derive succor uh, either when they win or when they lose, mm. and thereby advance their visions and prophecies. Am I correct in all of this so far? Yes. Okay. Do you agree with that, that, that counsel from President Obama? No, I don't. I mean, first of all, apocalyptic groups of all stripes, whether they're Muslim or not, reinterpret the prophecies as it suits them. Uh, and Islamic prophecies themselves say that one of the steps is Rome, or the West in their parlance, can make a truce uh, with the Muslims as well. Uh, we don't know why the Islamic State has chosen to go after Paris and the West more aggressively. We're not privy to their internal deliberations. And I think the United States and its allies have to take a cold look at the political situation on the ground, decide what is going to be most effective, and act on it. Because whatever we do, whether we stay out or go in, they will try and spin it to their advantage. How big a problem, really, for Western industrialized societies like France or the United States is ISIS. We're talking ultimately about 30,000 guys in pickup trucks with guns and a savvy use of social media, right? And a willingness to die, right. quite a few of them. Uh, add to that, you might have another 50,000 people uh, who are controlled in one form or fashion by ISIS, right? So I've, I've read an estimate of about 80,000 people, mm -hmm. 30,000 of whom are fighters, yep. right? Um, and yet, you know, you could marshal statistics to show that X hundred thousand people die in this country every year from heart disease or traffic accidents and so forth. Do you think that the threat posed by ISIS to our way of life, uh, to our freedom, our security, our liberty, is inflated? Uh, I do, to some measure. I mean, they present much more of a threat to their neighbors uh, in the Middle East. Um, they don't present an existential threat to this country, but what they do threaten are our politics and our discourse. Uh, they have a way of, of poisoning uh, politics in Western societies, making neighbors suspicious of one another, uh, coarsening uh, our discussions about security issues, and, you know, making people overreact, not just normal citizens, but also our government, uh, who in reaction uh, could be pressed by uh, the population to take tougher security measures that may not be warranted. So it's a careful balance we have to strike between civil liberties and protecting citizens, and ISIS's ability to carry out attacks in the West increases the impetus uh, for many more uh, uh, tougher security measures that I think erode our, our civil liberties as a consequence. So it sounds to me like you regard that the roughly speaking the program President Obama is embarked upon right now with respect to ISIS which he has explained to us many times is multi-pronged mm -hmm. uh, and which is going to take a long time and mm -hmm. which is going to produce setbacks amidst the progress and so forth you by and large endorse his approach by and large the one piece of it I would say is we haven't quite gotten our arms around ISIS in other countries in the Middle East and North Africa where they're waging insurgencies but by and large yes I think the, the president's challenge is that he is not good at connecting with the average American talking about security issues. He tries to calm nerves, which I understand and is laudable, but it's received as he doesn't take the security threat seriously enough, and it causes people to panic even more. I think the president should do a lot more to recognize that normal people are freaked out by the attacks that they've seen in Paris uh, and in California, uh, acknowledge those fears, but then explain concretely what he's trying to do. And we should regard this as a, as a surprising development if we accept what you're saying, because here, after all, was someone who was elected uh, in large measure on the strength of his oratorical skills. Right? That's right. That's right. And it's a surprising uh, gap in his talents. Uh, he's able to connect with soaring oratory, especially if it's on a lofty subject. But when it comes to security matters, 
um, he almost sounds like a dour professor and he has a tough time connecting with the average American who is scared by what they're seeing on their television. And let's face it, it wasn't all that long ago that the president stated publicly, we don't yet have a strategy. That's right. That and could it, not have helped exactly. confidence. No, that's exactly right. And it also plays into these fears that the president doesn't know what he's doing. Our visitor to the foxhole today is William McCants, who earned his doctorate in Near Eastern Studies at Princeton and is the author of The ISIS Apocalypse, The History, Strategy, and Doomsday Vision of the Islamic State, published in September by St. Martin's Press. You write in The ISIS Apocalypse, and I quote here, the question is, how will the jihadists evaluate the demise of the Islamic State? Will it prove to them that bin Laden was right, or will it prove that the state just needed to double down on its strategy? There's no obvious answer to the question because foreign powers always end the experiment prematurely. Even if a government established by global jihadists isn't serious about attacking foreign nations, those nations won't wait long to find out. The current political conditions in the Arab world all but ensure that some jihadists will follow the Islamic State's playbook, especially the group's growing number of affiliates or provinces. Large-scale violence heightens the appeal of apocalyptic narratives, particularly in areas mentioned in the prophecies, and it creates the political vacuums in which armed groups can flourish. Of course, William McCants writes in the ISIS apocalypse, the Islamic State copycats can be defeated using some of the same methods the international coalition is using against the state in Iraq and Syria. But the Islamic State has demonstrated that a modern caliphate is possible, that doomsday pronouncements and extreme violence attract bloodthirsty recruits, and that cutting out the hearts and minds of a population can subdue them faster than trying to win them over. This may not be bin Laden's jihad, but it's a formula future jihadists will find hard to resist. That from pages 158, 159 of the ISIS apocalypse. And so one cannot assume that you, that you, that you mean to argue that uh, the United States or its coalition partners should allow ISIS to grow a little bit, the, the Islamic State to grow a little bit longer no. before finding out whether it would be a, a suitable model for future jihadists, right? So, right. so what, what, are you, uh, what are you advocating there exactly? Well, we have to go in and get rid of it wherever it threatens our core interests. I mean, some of these Islamic State affiliates uh, should not rank very high in our uh, order of threats, uh, but some of them do rank quite high, and the one in Syria and Iraq is the most worrisome uh, because they threaten some of our major allies, in particular Saudi Arabia and Jordan, and they have a war chest of $2 billion that they can use to spend to fund global terror attacks abroad. They simply can't be allowed to have that kind of safe haven. I guess my worry is that given the instability in the Middle East and North Africa, there's just so many more places for them to go. And all of these conflicts in the area are very difficult to solve. We think Syria and Iraq is complicated, Libya is equally complicated. So I gather that you regard that simply leveling Raqqa, which is the headquarters of ISIS inside Syria, would not eliminate for us the ISIS problem. No, they're already sending a number of their senior leaders to Libya. Uh, they're moving resources there as well. The more that they get squeezed in Syria and Iraq, the more they will look to these other countries as a lifeboat to continue their program. I, I, I ask this simply by way of completeness. Uh, but by, in, in the writing of this book, did you have any opportunity to correspond with or otherwise uh, interact with any actual members of ISIS? Well, they yell at me a lot on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I try to avoid them, and I relied a lot on Arab journalists and our own American journalists who have been doing some amazing work in the region, as well as archival documents, captured documents mm -hmm. uh, that the United States has found over the past decade. Um, by many accounts, ISIS is, as you were telling me earlier, the most successful terrorist group of all time in terms of acquisition of territory, acquisition of hard cash, um, uh, uh, I guess a kind of um, uh, intimidating factor, mm -hmm. right? Um, so they're with us for some time to come. They are. And the political situation in Syria and Iraq does not go in our favor. I mean, the destruction of the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq is a top priority for the United States, but none of our allies in the region. They are all preoccupied with other things. And so we're pretty limited in what we can do until everybody is moving in the same direction. Is it fair to say that ISIS is waging asymmetric warfare against the United States and its allies? Uh, absolutely. And the attacks that you saw in Paris, 
uh, and other coordinated attacks we'll see in the future is a response to the U.S. and the allies bombing the Islamic State. They built the apparatus for carrying out these attacks as a way uh, to uh, deter and take revenge on the countries that were bombing it. But again, if they welcome some kind of apocalyptic showdown, which they may even lose the first round of, mm -hmm. um, are they really seeking to deter um, militaristic acts against them, such as our commander-in-chief might order, mm. or are they welcoming of it? Are they trying to provoke further such demonstrations? Boy, it is hard to say, because from their propaganda, they have said both things. Now, on the one hand, it's a deterrent. On the other hand, it's a provocation. And I will note that al-Qaeda itself viewed the 9-11 attacks in the first instance as a deterrent, and if that didn't work, as a provocation for complete invasion. What draws, drives them nuts is this middle of the road approach, using air power and special forces. They would rather we go all out or all in. Do you discern uh, great uh, distinctions to be made between Al-Qaeda as an entity and mm -hmm. ISIS as an entity, aside from the success of ISIS? Um, look. The way that they view the infidel West, no, they are exactly the same. They both want to carry out attacks in the West uh, against the non-believers. But in the Muslim world, they make finer distinctions. Al-Qaeda in particular is trying to build a broad-based movement in the Muslim world. Not very successful, but that's their attempt. The Islamic State is different. It is trying to polarize Muslim popular opinion and recruit from the extreme minority. You, you, you made reference to that term, the Muslim world, mm. right? And which is a shorthand and recognized here as such. But as we both know, the Muslim world is not monolithic. Mm. Do you sense that the Muslim world writ large is sufficiently seized of the threat of radical jihadism and is doing enough amongst its own flock, so to speak, to curb that or diffuse it or even stamp it out? Well, I think in the earlier days of the war against al-Qaeda, um, there was not as much energy behind that effort. Um, they really saw this as the West's problem and a function of Western politics. But I think because of the Arab Spring, because of the United States staying out of the Syrian conflict, people have begun to realize more and more that this is a sickness at home and they have to treat it. And so there is much more enthusiasm now for speaking out against uh, the Islamic State. Do you regard that whenever we hear about international coalitions to combat ISIS or international terrorism at large, uh, that these are in essence fig leaves? Uh, that in essence it usually com comes down to the United States or from its perspective Russia uh, and that they're, th that they're really, you know, these coalitions are kind of illusory? Um, yes. I mean, usually it ends up being the United States carrying the burden and that's particularly frustrating the current conflict where the Islamic State poses the least threat to the American homeland and yet we are carrying the greater share of the burden in fighting it. How did you get interested in this subject? Why, why did you write this book? Oh, well, I mean, I have been studying this for over a decade. Um, and now, let's stop right there, because yeah. most people don't imagine that ISIS is a decade old. Right. right? Uh, we hear repeatedly that ISIS arose from uh, the old AQI, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. That's right. right. And using those means, President Obama has sometimes, I think, sought to suggest that ISIS is really a byproduct mm -hmm. of the Bush-Cheney invasion of Iraq. Mm. Okay. Elsewhere, however, President Obama has admitted that AQI was defeated yeah. as a result of the surge and the Sunni awakening. Yeah. So if AQI was defeated, it stands to reason that uh, ISIS, uh, the rise of ISIS is something that is properly attributed to President Obama's tenure. ISIS thrives on a political vacuum. President Bush created a political vacuum when he invaded and he disbanded the military and the intelligence apparatus. President Obama created a vacuum when he drew down American forces from Iraq. ISIS was able to grow as a consequence of both. Hmm. Um, and so anyway, uh, when you say that you've been studying this for 10 years, are you telling us ISIS is 10 years old? Yeah, the founding of the Islamic State goes back to 2006, and as you said, uh, their forerunner was Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, so they've been around for a while. Um, I've read that in proclaiming a caliphate, which was a very bold move that I've, I've read Osama bin Laden would never have even dreamt of doing, that al-Qaeda and bin Laden saw the struggle as being a much longer one, right? Uh, at, by, by, by declaring a caliphate, al-Baghdadi, uh, both in showing that boldness, 
has also exposed himself internally to a great deal of risk because, attendant upon the caliph, are any number of expectations about he, how he will behave and mm -hmm. what he will deliver in some frame of time, correct? Right. Um, there is an expectation that your normal Muslim ruler is uh, oftentimes going to behave badly as, as any politician might. But when you proclaim yourself to be caliph, uh, in many ways uh, Muslims will hold that person to a higher standard. Uh, and Baghdadi has done so, uh, and as a consequence, the Muslim world has been pretty vocal in speaking out against his so-called caliphate. A, a higher standard of what? Uh, of conduct, of uh, conduct of war, of conduct of governance. Um, there is a lot of expectations put on the caliph that he will abide by Islamic scripture, and the criticism from Muslims has been that uh, Baghdadi has not been so faithful to scripture, that he has used it uh, in a utilitarian fashion when it suits him, uh, but he is ignoring the parts of scripture that cut against the way he wants to govern. Because I had read, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, one of the Quranic uh, mandates for the caliph is that he shall preside over something akin to perpetual warfare, uh, perpetual conflict with the infidels. That's not in the Quran, but it is in classical Islamic thinking about Islamic states. The first duty of the, rule, the, of the caliph is to spread Islam, and he offers it peacefully to neighboring non-Muslim nations, and if they don't agree, then that is a cause for war. So certainly that's an expectation that ultra-conservative Muslims would place on the so-called Baghdadi if they accept his caliphate. Should we, on the basis simply of the results we see before us, across the world and across these regions of North Africa and the Middle East, conclude that there is something about Islam that, uh, uniquely as opposed to other religions, makes its adherence susceptible to uh, unwarranted violence like terrorism and jihadism? Um, I, I would say not. I mean, most Muslims are not on board with the Islamic State, uh, but they, most Muslims also happen to live in developing countries uh, where violence is endemic, and they are drawing on a religious tradition uh, of which violence is a part. So if they're looking to justify their own violent politics, there are passages in Scripture that can justify it, just as there are passages in their same Scripture that cut against it. And is that true for other religions and their scriptural works? Uh, no. I mean, I would say in Christianity, of course, in the Gospels, uh, Jesus goes out of his way to avoid conflict with the state. Um, uh, in Judaism, however, you have a much closer analogy with Islam. Uh, in Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and so forth, uh, violence is very much a part of establishing a religious state. Our guest here in the foxhole today has been William McCann's adjunct faculty member at the Johns Hopkins University, director of the Brookings Institution's Project on U.S. Relations with the Islamic World, and author of The ISIS Apocalypse, The History, Strategy, and Doomsday Vision of the Islamic State, published in September by St. Martin's Press. William, thank you for joining us here in the foxhole. It's my pleasure. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of The Foxhole. I'm your host, James Rosen, signing off from the Washington Bureau of Fox News. You can follow me on Twitter, at James Rosen FNC, and we will FNC you next time.